Now, the name Benedict Arnold is synonymous in American history with the word traitor. His name is almost a synonym for treasonous behavior so despicable, his many contributions to the American independence have largely been forgotten. Now, Arnold actually built a very impressive military career before his defection to the British Army. Born in the British colony of Connecticut in 1741, he was the only child of 11 to survive into adulthood. He spent his young adulthood engaged as an apothecary and merchant, but also served in the militia as well. Now, during the American Revolution, Arnold quickly established himself as one of General George Washington's best generals. Realizing the strategic importance of securing New York, Arnold mustered a group of men and headed towards Fort Ticonderoga. Coordinating with Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys, Arnold helped to capture the fort for the Patriots. But something we often don't talk about, Arnold got sour because Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys got recognized and nobody recognized what he did to secure Fort Ticonderoga. Also, immediately following that, Arnold suffered two battle wounds for the American cause in 1776, the first in a failed attack on Quebec, and the second at the Battle of Saratoga. If I remember correctly, in one of those uh, wounds, he injured a hand that he only had limited use of, and in another one of those injuries, he was, he was wounded in the leg, where he ended up finishing his life walking with a limp. So each time he walked with a limp or each time he found himself not using or being able to use fully his hand, he was reminded of five different subordinates of his that got promoted above him and he felt slighted. And the bitterness began to well up and it began to seethe inside him. In fact, Arnold's behavior eventually came to frustrate his relationships with the continental officials. He feuded with several officers in the Continental Army, including Moses Hazen, John Brown, and James Easton. Arnold lived extravagantly in Philadelphia and also engineered a variety of business deals that earned him a reputation for questionable practices and his desperate desire to impress Edward Shippen, a wealthy Philadelphia loyalist, so that he could marry his 18-year-old daughter, Peggy. Arnold's behavior uh, became so questionable that some began to suspect he was covertly dealing with the British to make his money. Although he successfully secured Peggy's hand, Arnold's extravagance and imprudence ultimately drove him deep into debt. Continental officials could not confirm Arnold's suspected betrayal until 1780 when hard evidence of his treason was uncovered. The Americans captured Major John Andre. Uh, Arnold's British contact, who was in possession of paperwork, revealing Arnold's treason. After receiving command of West Point in 1779, Arnold willingly provided the British with vital information for taking control of West Point. Imagine the British having control of West Point. Andre was executed for his crimes while, while Arnold managed to escape to England. Now, most of us can't remember any of the accomplishments of Benedict Arnold as far as what he did for the American Revolution. But we all recognize and remember he was a traitor. And the war could have easily gone the other way had not his treachery been exposed. Now, we had an enemy that we didn't even know we had. In the spiritual fight we face, it's important to understand our enemy so that with God's help, We can defeat him. Now, you can't fight an enemy you can't recognize or understand who you're facing. And this morning, as we continue our series Fight Club, we're going to first identify our enemy. And I want you to see, first of all, the personality of our enemy. The one thing I want you to realize, first off, is that our enemy is proud. It was pride that removed Satan from his seat in heaven. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 14, For thou hast said in thine heart, speaking of Satan... I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Lucifer the devil had an eye problem. Not an eye problem here, but an eye problem. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit upon. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
He wanted the position and praise that was only supposed to be directed and belong to God. And as a result, he was demoted and cast out of his position in heaven. Now, our enemy is proud. He thinks his way is better than God's way. He thinks his thinking and his philosophy are the only way. He thinks that people that rely and believe and trust in God are weak. And he thinks he is strong. And he tries to take people with him in this falsity of pride. Down his anti-God philosophical wormhole. He is proud and he wants man to be proud. He wants man to put himself in the place of God. To think negative thoughts about God. To think that he, man, is himself God. Like he thought. Our enemy is proud. Our enemy is seasoned. From the beginning of time, our enemy has been seeking the fulfillment of his own desires and, and trying to get others to follow against God. We see him first in heaven as one of the most beautiful of all creation. Ezekiel 28 pictures him this way in the Garden of Eden. Thou hast been in the Garden of Eden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis and the topaz and the diamond and the beryl and the onyx and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and pipes were prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. He was this beautiful, worshipful being that led all heaven in praise to God. But notice what the next verse says in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now we see him in the next, in the next instance being lifted up in pride and demoted from his position in heaven as an angel in Isaiah 14. And the next time we see him, he's sometimes pre sometime presented after creation in the Garden of Eden, personified as a serpent, trying to tempt man away from God. The Bible says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden. He was involved in the fall of man in Genesis 3. He was involved in the first murder in Genesis chapter 4. He was involved in the deterioration of the earth due to pride and sin recorded in Genesis chapter 6. He was involved in Noah's drunkenness in Genesis chapter 9. He was involved in Nimrod's desire to build his own empire and a tower to worship his own religion in Genesis chapter 11. He is seasoned. He knows man, he knows our tendencies, he knows what makes man tick, he knows what entices man and what leads man away from God. Our enemy is also deceitful. We see his deceit in the garden. The Bible says again, now the serpent was more subtle, more sneaky, if you will, of any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He used his deceit to question God and to make Eve believe that God was keeping something from her. The Bible says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit, fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You will not surely die. He used deceit. To get Eve to question what God had said. To question God's word. And he does the same always to us today. It may go something like this. If God really cared about you, why would he let you go through all of these tough times? If your wife or your husband really loved you, why would they really treat you this way? If you really were a man, why can't you do this? If you really were the woman of God that God made you to be, why can't you do this? And he's always getting us to question what God has said. He's deceitful. Our enemy is cunning. His bag full of tricks is full. And if you think you are wise, if you think you are clever, if you think you could never fall to his temptations and attacks, you are wrong. Our text says in Ephesians 6, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of 
the devil. The devil will use cunning. The devil will use craftiness. And he'll bring his whole arsenal of weaponry necessary to beguile and tempt and lead God's people away from God and lead man away from God. In fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and he said, Lest Satan get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We should always be on the lookout because the devil is going to try everything in his bag of tricks to try to dissuade us. And then we see something else. Our enemy is intent on destruction of everything that God has created. You see, he tried to destroy heaven and was cast out. He tried to destroy God's creation, but God sovereignly has sustained it. He tried to destroy man and everything associated with man. And he tries to take what God has created as good, and he tries to manipulate it. Man and woman were created in the image of God, each distinct, each displaying the manifold wisdom of God. But yet, the devil, even today, has tried to destroy any distinguishing characteristics between man and woman and, and brought sex confusion or identity confusion. Sex, which is beautiful within the context of marriage between a man and his wife, yet the devil has tried to destroy sex uh, with the pleasure of sex being the focus. No matter who it harms, no matter how it destroys, no ma matter how it trivializes, the devil has tried to destroy, destroy that which is supposed to reflect the ultimate love between a man and his wife and a wife and her husband into a simple act of gratification. You see, everything God has created that is good, the devil has sought to destroy that's why the Bible says, the thief cometh not but for to rob and to steal and to kill. But Jesus goes on to say, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I want you to understand our devil, the devil, our devil, the devil is also powerful. Our enemy is powerful. You see, there are two dangers in a fight. One is you can overestimate your opponent's power. And then secondly... You can underestimate your opponent's power. Now, it's apparent in history that at times, Satan has been trivialized and ignored. Now, his actual existence has even been doubted or maybe been made fun of, usually depicted as some ludicrous creature dressed in red flannel underwear with horns and a tail and a pitchfork. But I want you to understand he's not impotent. In fact, the Bible depicts him in Revelation and a rage against man. It says in Revelation 12, 12, it says, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now, the Bible depicts him in 1 Peter as a wounded, hungry lion. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking who he may devour. You see, the devil's powerful philosophy is intensified by the fact that he has been thrown out of heaven. Like a wounded lion, knowing that his end is near, he attacks with a vengeance because he hates man. He is powerful, but I want you to understand he is not all powerful in fact god the father god the son god the spirit are all powerful they are omnipotent they are all knowing they are omniscient they are everywhere at all times they're omnipresent but the devil is none of those things he and his forces are limited in their ability to tempt and besiege mankind because god is still sovereignly in control of everything in fact we see that in the life of job in Job's life, we see that the devil was going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. And the angels were presenting themselves before God. And the devil was amongst them, the Bible says. And we pick up in Job chapter 1 and verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and uh, shies away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? 
Have you not uh, made a hedge about him and about his house and all that he hath on every side? God, you have been protecting him. God, you have been hedging him about. You have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And we understand that in the midst of that, Job had all of his children taken from him. He had all of his possessions taken from him. He had uh, his wife sour against him. And even his health was taken from him. But in the midst of that, Job said things like, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. In the midst of that, Job said things like, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, even though Satan tempted Job, God was still sovereignly in control. And we see the same teaching found in the New Testament concerning you and me. 1 Corinthians teaches us that God will not allow the believer to be tempted above the ability with God's help to resist. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with that temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Now, we understand that uh, the devil cannot make things irresistible. He can make things tempting, but we understand that the devil cannot force us to do anything. God is still in control. The, the old phrase, the devil made me do it, that's wrong. Because the devil doesn't make us do anything. Now, he, he can't read our thoughts. He can't read our minds. But you know what? He and his minions know our, and can know our history. And they can put thoughts into our mind. But they can't make us do anything. Now, we've seen some of the personality traits of our enemy, we, we want to next look at the person of our enemy. Now, our enemies are the world and the flesh, energized and enticed by the devil. Now, you and I cannot fight a fight if we do not know who the enemy is. Our enemies are the world. The Greek word for world is the word cosmos. which refers to uh, the system or culture that operates and turns people towards themselves. Ushers, can I get some help? Thank you. Uh, turns people towards themselves, pleasure, covetousness, and pride, all of which are against God. The flesh, the Greek word sarx, the seed of sin and rebellion, our inborn uh, broken tendencies to do wrong, handed down from our first father, Adam. Now, both the world and the flesh are energized, incentivized, and enticed by the devil. Now, and here's how the Bible presents it in Ephesians. It says, "Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The devil has a complex system at work in the world, leading people away from God, and he often uses this system to incite the desires we have in our flesh. Our enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And let me say this, our enemy is not one another. Our enemy is not one another. As the Bible speaks of spiritual warfare, it clearly says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, I get it. Sometimes people do things and say things and scheme things to hurt us emotionally, to sour our reputations with others, to turn people against us, and maybe even sometimes physically injure us. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't and can't protect ourselves or establish healthy boundaries or that we shouldn't take a stand for the truth. But we must never forget our fight isn't with them. Now, I'm not saying we can't believe certain things about morality 
In fact, the Bible speaks uh, highly of morality. And I'm not saying that the things in this world that others disagree with should be tossed out for the sake of uh, a unity excluding the truth. But we must never forget the people who we disagree with are not our enemy. I'm not saying there may not be a time that we go to war and bring loss of life and face loss of life, having to protect our country and our freedoms and our families. But we must never forget the real enemy, the devil, using the system of the world which is against God, which thrives on destruction and devastation in our flesh, which wants to fulfill its own desires. Now, you can disagree with someone and understand that they are not your enemy. You can have boundaries with someone and understand that they are not your enemy. You can have uh, someone hate your guts even while you've tried to do right by them, and they may view you as, your, as, as their enemy, but as a believer, they are not your enemy. The devil, which is trying to control the world and our flesh, is the enemy. Notice again the text, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Who do you think is behind division? And then we see one last thing. Our enemy is organized. Now, in studying for this series, I obviously read the passages in the Bible that speak of spiritual warfare. I've also read several books that speak of spiritual warfare. I read some old books uh, back from like the 70s and 80s as well. Some of you remember uh, This Present Darkness and This Past Darkness by Frank Peretti. And those are books that when you read them, uh, they kind of get the hairs on the back of your spine to kind of stand up. And you can't really sleep at night. And there's other things that I've looked at. And studied, and I could share some things with you that probably would make you guys not sleep at night. But the Bible says this it says, Be simple concerning that which is evil, and wise concerning that which is good. I'm gonna get you familiarized with what the Bible has to say about our organized enemy. You see, in God's angelic kingdom, there seems to be an hierarchy. It is the same with those angels who have followed Satan. And the book of Revelation pictures these angels being cast out of heaven, and like the devil, they also have vengeance in their heart. It says in Revelation chapter 12, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels. And they prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, the book of Jude tells us that these angels will be judged, we ultimately know, by Jesus himself. Jude 1.6 says, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, they were created to worship God, but they didn't keep their first estate. They didn't keep according to the plan that God created them for, but they left their habitation. God is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And when the Bible speaks of this organization of enemies in, in chapter uh, 6 of uh, verse 12 of Ephesians, it says, it speaks of principalities. Now, the Greek word is the word arche, meaning a supernatural being acting in a ruling or governing capacity. In Ezekiel chapter 28, the king of Tyre is being presented as literally being possessed by the devil himself. If you read the chapter in the context, that's what it bears out. Now, the Bible speaks of powers. The Greek word is exoesis, uh, meaning one who exercises an administrative control over others. The Bible speaks of the rulers of the darkness of this world. The Greek word is kosmokratos, meaning influential entities trying to control humans and prenatural entities, other spiritual forces. And then we have one last word. It speaks of spiritual wickedness in high places. And the Greek phrase for that is pneumatica porneos epikoranos, meaning immaterial, supernatural aspects of reality affecting the human soul, leading them to perverting principles, porneos, and purposes by their heavenly, angelic, powerful means. 
The devil is organized, and he's bent on destroying all of God's creation, including man. And I have no doubt that as we sit, as we're here today, as we go about our business, there are forces in the unseen realm that are working against us, that are trying to entice our flesh, that are trying to put things in front of us and above us so we think contrary to God. Principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, as I've studied the passages that deal with spiritual warfare, the Bible gives several verbs that we need to be aware of in our fight against the enemy and speak literally of how we can prevail against the enemy. Now, first of all, we must rely on the faithfulness of God. Notice again the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be attempted above that which you are able, but with that temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, as we deal with temptation, we need to understand that God will not allow temptation or circumstance to become completely irresistible. He has provided a way of escape and realize this and rest on God's resources and God's faithfulness. It may be something like this. Maybe you can commit 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31 to memory. And as you're tempted to be angry and as you want to expose your flesh, you, you quote 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. God, I realize that you're in control. And God, I realize you're not going to put anything in front of me that uh, you will not allow me to have the ability to, to get victory over through Jesus. And so, God, I'm angry right now. And God, I don't want to cave in to hurt people. I don't want to hurt relationships. I don't want to hurt myself. I don't want to injure others. So God, help me in this moment. Help me to have your power. Rely on the faithfulness of God. Secondly, be alert. Be alert. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Anytime I go into a restaurant or a public place, I'm always looking where the exits are. I'm always identifying where people are in the room. I'm always identifying where I am in the room. I want to see the whole room as I'm there. If I can, if possible, I, can you sit me with my seat, if I'm dealing with the hostess, can you sit me over there so my back is against the wall and I can see everything? Now, why do I do that? I guess I've spent too much time around law enforcement friends, all right? Uh, I see what they do, and it's, it's a thing always in my mind. And my head is always on a swivel. This past week, I had the opportunity to go to California, and uh, where I was staying was right on the beach, and uh, just a couple blocks away was one of the main downtown areas, and, and I didn't really want to get in my car anymore because I'd driven uh, six, seven hours to get to where I was, and I didn't want to get in my car, and so I wanted to walk anywhere I had to go or eat or whatever, and so I'm walking around, and as I'm walking around, my head is on a swivel. I'm recognizing where people are in front of me, behind me, where cars are, where, where sidewalks are, where alleyways are. And in fact, I was uh, walking down the sidewalk and there was a bike that I could feel coming up close to me. And as I turned around, he was like darting right towards me. And then when I turned around, he went another way. And I'm like, you better, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but uh, it just was, you're, you, when you're like that, it kind of keeps things maybe from possibly happening. And you know what? I'm like that physically. But you know what? More importantly, we need to be that way spiritually. And here's what the Bible says. It, be, it says, be sober. Be serious about this. Don't take the devil lightly. Don't think he's not for real. Don't think you have the wherewithal to get victory on your own. Be sober. Be serious. Because your adversary, the devil, like a wounded lion... Walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Be serious and be vigilant. Thirdly, stand with God's help. When the Bible speaks about the spiritual armaments 
that we have is our equipping as Christians. We talked some about that last week. We'll talk more about it in the weeks to come. We'll address it just briefly here for a moment. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 14, after the armaments are talked about, or right there when the armaments are talked about, it says, Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the Greek word for stand is the word hestemai which means to face or withstand with courage. And I want you to understand this. Courage comes from belief. As we believe the right things or in the right person, we then are encouraged. And as we believe in God, believe that he has equipped us, believe in what he's done for us through Jesus Christ, believe that he's strong enough to defeat our enemy, we then can have courage, but that's the only way we can stand. Stand. And then next, there's another verb that is mentioned as the Bible speaks about prevailing in spiritual warfare. James chapter 4 presents us with another word. It says, He giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. And then it says in verse 8, Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. We must humble ourselves. Now, humility causes us to become more dependent upon God. And God gives grace to the humble. But God resists the proud. And as we surrender and submit by getting close to God, we are literally becoming strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But it it starts by understanding our limits understanding our need, humbling ourselves, going to God, fleeing to him, fleeing to his truth, and getting close. And here's the thing, as you get close to God, he gets closer than you ever imagined to you. And then we see one last thing, another verb that's mentioned in our fight to prevail in spiritual warfare. We must resist the devil, but we resist by getting close to God. It says in James again, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, And he will flee from you, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You see, as we draw nigh to God, that is our effort to resist. That is how we resist. We don't rebuke the devil and expect the devil to go from us because we rebuked him in Jesus' name. It's not how it works. You see that on television, but that's not how it works. You know how we resist and rebuke the devil? We get, we get the devil, we're able to resist the devil by drawing close to God. And here's what happens when we draw close to God, we cleanse our hands. We go to people that we've wronged and we say, you know what, I've wronged you, will you forgive me? I've said this to you, I hurt you in this way. We go to our spouse, we go to our children. We go to a coworker, we go to a family member, and as we get close to God, we begin to cleanse our hands on our own. And then we begin to purify our hearts. We get clear consciences. But it all starts by drawing nigh and humbling ourselves before God. So this morning, I want to ask you, have you identified your enemy? Do you know his personality? How about his person? Are we fighting the right enemies? Are we fighting the enemies God's way? Maybe this morning some of us need to humble ourselves. Maybe we need to go back to to getting into God's truth so we can believe and have more courage to stand against the spiritual attacks that we face. Maybe we need to fall on the faithfulness of God because God will not allow us to be tempted above that which we're able, but with that temptation always provide a way of escape that we may be able to. To bear it. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The greatest thing that Jesus did for you and for me, he came to this earth. He lived a perfect life for 33 years. He culminated that life by dying on the cross for our sins. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then they put him in a tomb, and three days later, he conquered death. He showed that he conquered death, and he conquered sin, and he conquered the grave by raising from the dead. Have you received Jesus? 
as the start of your spiritual life so you can begin to understand what it means to get spiritual victory.